Hear the word of the Lord from Genesis chapter 23. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my Lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land, and he said to them, If you're willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me, Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites of all who went in at the gate of, the, of his city. No, my lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, but if you will hear me, I give the price of the field, accept it from me that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, my Lord, listen to me, a piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron and Abraham and weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron and Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field at Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a bearing place by the Hittites. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, Sojourn. Peace be with you. Like Matt said, well, you might not have said this. My name is Paul Ramsey. Um, I am one of the pastors here, and it's an honor to be preaching God's word for us this morning. This is the last time, at least for a long time, that I'll be able to say that as a pastor of this church. This is my last sermon uh, in my current capacity as one of your pastors, and it is surreal for me. Um, I stand before you a deeply grateful man for the many years of being a member of this church, of serving in this church. Um, I'm tired after several years of very difficult labor for the sake of the gospel here at Sojourn. But even as I'm tired, I'm deeply grateful. I've spent the last month offloading my various responsibilities to the staff, um, and I'm deeply grateful for them. Please pray for your elders and your staff as they continue to labor here uh, for the sake of the gospel. And today, as I open God's word to preach, I can think of really no better way to finish my job here at Sojourn Heights than to open God's word, which is one of the highest honors uh, of mine as one of your pastors. This passage that's before us is a passage about loss. It's about the end of one chapter and another chapter beginning. We've been in a sermon series walking through the life of Abraham from the book of Genesis. And here we come to the death of Sarah, Abraham's wife, and we're confronted with the reality that God's people must suffer loss as we await the arrival of God's promises. In being a passage about loss, though, it's also a passage about hope. We'll see that even in the midst of loss, Abraham is continuing to walk in faith and in hope as he loves his wife even beyond death. So as we jump in, would you bow your head and pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the tremendous honor that it is for me to serve as a pastor here at Sojourn Heights and to preach your word. I pray your blessing over our time together as we look at Genesis chapter 23. We thank you for the preservation of these words for us. And we ask that you would speak to us 
that you would invite us and spur us on in our faith as we engage with your word together this morning. We ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, I read a book called A Praying Life by a pastor named Paul Miller. Um, And in this book, there's a section about cynicism. I think this section is probably worth the price of the whole book. The section talks about the fact that cynicism is the pervasive spirit of this age in American culture. Cynicism is, at a fundamental level, distrust in the motivations of others, presenting itself as realism often, or sometimes called disenchantment. Cynicism is a mindset where the real story about a person is different from the story that you are receiving explicitly. Being cynical is seen as being tuned into what's really going on. And in this way, cynicism is a really tantalizing temptation. We all have a desire to know the real story behind the scenes. According to the Bible, the original temptation of Satan in the Garden of Eden was fundamentally a temptation towards cynicism, towards distrust in God's motivations. God's not really trying to take care of you. He's trying to keep you from eating the fruit because he knows that if you eat it, you'll become like him. It's a temptation towards cynicism. It's interesting, though, that cynicism often finds its root in optimism, but not a wise and hopeful optimism, a naive and overconfident optimism. Go with me for a moment. In many ways, American culture is the most optimistic culture in the world and in history. This comes in many ways from our Judeo-Christian roots. If you see the world through the lens of the goodness of God, that there's a God who loves you and is working all things to their intended ends and for your good, then that tends toward an optimistic outlook. Because as Psalm 23 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with me. Even when I'm in the presence of enemies, he prepares a table before me. But somewhere around the 19th century, the fundamental understanding of our culture shifted from the goodness of God to the goodness of humanity. In the words of Paul Miller, faith became an end in itself. President Roosevelt rallied the nation during the Depression by calling people to have faith in faith. In The Sound of Music, Julie Andrews sang about having confidence in confidence itself. Disneyland, the icon of naive optimism, promises that we'll find Prince Charming and live happily ever after. But optimism rooted in the goodness of people collapses when it confronts the dark side of life. He continues, the discovery for evil for most of us is highly personal. We encounter the cruelty of our friends in junior and senior high. In college, the princes turn out to be less than charming. If we have children, we learn that they can be demanding and self-centered. Shattered optimism sets us up for the fall into defeated weariness and eventually cynicism. You'd think it would leave us simply less optimistic, but we humans don't do neutral well. We go from seeing the bright side of everything to seeing the dark side of everything. We feel betrayed by life. This is very much the spirit of our age. Paul Miller goes on to say that the movement from naive optimism to cynicism is the new American journey. The book is very good. I strongly recommend it. And he's getting at the heart of why we don't pray. And neither the naive optimist nor the cynic has any reason to pray. The problem is that both naive optimism and cynicism are tied to fantasy and not reality. It's the same error, just made in different ways. The naive optimist lives in a fantasy world where everything is under control and everything works out just fine. The cynic lives in a fantasy world where everything is out of control and nothing will turn out fine. They're both fantasy worlds, but there is a third option. And it's the way of hope. Hope that is tethered to reality. Hope that is shaped and cultivated over the course of life with God and that prepares us for eternity with him. And that's what we're looking at today. As we look at this passage, we're going to be looking at hope. And we'll look at three points. We'll look at the shaping of hope, the pursuit of hope, and the security of hope. The shaping of hope, the pursuit of hope, and the security of hope. So let's jump in with the first point, the shaping of hope. If there's one thing that's become clear over the story of the life of Abraham that we've come across so far, it's that 
we've seen that God has been shaping him into the father of all who believe, as the Apostle Paul calls him in Romans chapter 4. From his calling in Haran when he's still with his family, to the back and forth situations with foreign kings where his life is at risk, to being asked to sacrifice his son Isaac as a test of his faith, and then God providing the substitute at the last minute so that his son could be spared. God has been active in Abraham's life. He's been shaping him, teaching him, molding him through the big details and the small details of his life, through the happy things that happen and the not so happy things that have happened. All have contributed to the man of faith that Abraham is becoming. And here we see that Abraham is brought to the point of profound loss. Verse one, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And then verse two, Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So Sarah has died. And Sarah's death is a pivotal point in the overall narrative of the Bible. Abraham and Sarah were recipients of the glorious promises of God. God has chosen Abraham as a man from among the nations to be the father of a multitude, the father of a family that would become a great nation and through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed. But then Sarah dies. And with Sarah, we see the beginning of a sad but firm reality. The early recipients of the promises began to die without receiving the promises. And this is sad. Abraham laments her death. We're told that he went in to mourn for Sarah. He goes in to be present with her dead body. And there's intense language here. We read at the end of verse 2 that he goes in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So he doesn't just mourn, he mourns and he weeps. The doubling is significant in the original language. Shows an intensity in the word for weeping there is an, is an allowed kind of weeping. He would have mourned and cried aloud in sorrow. Our culture doesn't know what to do with death. If you think about it, neither the naive optimist nor the cynic has much time for mourning the death of a lost one. Death doesn't fit very well in the mindset of the naive optimist for whom everything is supposed to work out in the end. So it's probably better to just avoid the sadness by putting on a smile and celebrating the good things about the person. We're going to have a celebration of life, not a funeral. Death fits so perfectly within the mindset of the cynic that there's no need to make much to do about it at all. Of course she was going to die. Let's just move on with our lives. Both the naive optimist and the cynic find their ways to avoid engaging with the pain of death. But not so with Abraham. He goes to be with Sarah's dead body. He's mourning. He's grieved, weeping at the loss of his wife. And where is God at this point in Abraham's life? At the point when Sarah dies, has God abandoned him? Wasn't God supposed to keep his wife alive? See, there's several key themes in the book of Genesis. We've seen a number of them in this series so far. We've seen faith and trust being key themes. We see the promise of the land as a key theme in the book of Genesis. Another big one, however, is death. Death was mentioned in the Garden of Eden as a consequence for sin. And every death is a harsh reminder of the presence of evil in the world and in the human heart. In this passage, the number of times words pertaining to death or burial make it clear that death must be reckoned with. This is a passage about death and what to do with death. Even for Abraham, a man who has received the glorious promises from God, death is inevitable. So here in Sarah's death, we have this extraordinary tension that's set up between these promises of God and the presence of death. But rather than that being a problem, the two are inherently connected. The presence of death is a reminder of the presence of evil, but that's exactly what God's promise is focused upon. God has promised to do away with evil. But if God had decided to do away with evil right away, he would have had to sweep away humanity itself because sin is not just a problem out there, it's inside the human heart. Instead, God's plan is a plan of redemption. He would bring about his plans for humanity through humanity. And it would be a plan that would be paid for at the highest cost. God's plan is a plan that involves suffering, culminating in the suffering of his own son. 
but it would be worth it because God's children would be saved from wrath and granted to live with him forever. This is God's plan. And so where was God at this point? What was God doing? He was right in the middle of things. He was guiding and shaping, shaping Abraham into a faithful man who was awaiting the promises of God. As we watch Abraham mourning the death of Sarah, let's be struck by the profound message that is preserved for us here in the Bible. We must suffer loss as we await the fulfillment of God's promises. And it's not a diversion from the plan of God. Rather than suffering being an interruption of God's purposes in our lives, suffering is instead an instrument in God's hands that he uses for our good. As the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, not only do we rejoice in hope of the glory of God, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So when we encounter loss, loss brings us suffering. But in God's providence, suffering is not the end. Suffering produces endurance, which produces character, which produces hope. And this is true hope, not naive optimism that believes that things are all going to turn, turn out fine for you if you just keep your chin up. But hope that is shaped by suffering that is pointed, therefore, in the right direction. Not in this situation working out perfectly, but the great plan of redemption will work out for all of our good. This is what God is doing with Abraham. He's shaping this kind of hope in his heart. And now, Sojourn, I want you to think about your life for a moment. Where have you experienced loss? Loss, of course, is experienced in the death of a loved one, but if you allow the category of loss to broaden for just a moment, think about disappointment in general. What have been the shaping disappointments in your life? How have those shaped you? How have you reacted to them? I've had a number of disappointments in my life. I have lost loved ones. There's also many other ways in which I've been disappointed. The past 10 years of ministry, while joyful in many ways, have also been marked by various kinds of disappointments, both personally and also for in the churches that I've been a part of, in the lives of people that I've loved. It's also true of my life in general. And if you know me at all, you know that I'm an optimist. And those who know me best know that this is actually how I see the world. It's not a facade. I'm an optimist to a fault. Forget the glass being half full. If the glass even has 10%, is, if it's even 10% full, at least that's a sip of water. I won't be thirsty. <laughs> this isn't about character as much as it's about temperament. And actually being an optimist isn't as great as it sounds. Because disappointment, especially when I'm unable to, unable to avoid the sadness of disappointment, is deeply troubling for me. But it's disappointment especially that God has used to shape my heart. He has forced me to engage with grief and sorrow and lament in a way that's taught me where my hope should truly be placed. That I don't need to do the work of finding the silver lining all the time. I can trust that God is good no matter what happens and that he has a plan for all of this. If anything, it's not that I've grown into a wisely optimistic person as I've matured, it's that I've been straining, or rather God has been straining to bring me back from foolish optimism that's based in fantasy rather than reality. That's me though. How do you engage with disappointment? Abraham mourns and weeps. He faces his loss literally. He goes in and he spends time with Sarah's dead body saddened to the point of weeping, crying out in the pain of loss. Is this what you do when you are faced with disappointment? Do you lean in and experience the pain and the way that that pain is shaping your heart and mind and hope for redemption? Or have you tended to try to avoid disappointment? If you want to avoid pain, spend as much time as you can on this thing. Our cell phones and other devices provide a really effective replacement for reality. On our cell phones, whatever devices, you get to live through people whose faces look like you want them to look, whose bodies look like you want yours to look, whose houses, jobs, vacations, pranks, trick shots, 
All of these things engage your attention and pull your heart away from your own life, your real life. You see, we do this and we spend so much time because life in the real world is hard. In the real world, people suffer and get hurt. You suffer and get hurt. The reason that belief that everything will work out in the end can't last in the real world is because it's simply not true. How often have you prayed for someone to get better and they don't? Awful situations sometimes don't turn around. Sometimes things don't get better. They get worse and then you die. This is life in the real world. The good news, though, is that God is the God of the real world. He is present in the real world, in the here and now with you and with me. And he is working through the here and now in you and in me to shape us and bring about his redemptive purposes for the whole world. God doesn't want us to suffer. But when we suffer on account of living in the real world, which is marred by sin, God will use that suffering to produce endurance and character and hope, pointing us to the plan that he has for all things. And he's using all that happens in this real world that he created and placed you in, including loss and disappointment, to shape you. So lean in. So often we are tempted to avoid this pain, but lean in because Christian hope is hope that is shaped by God. That's the first point. Christian hope is hope that is shaped. As we move to the second point, let's read on. Verse 3. And Abraham rose up from his dead, from before his dead, and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Pause there. So after a time of mourning, we see that Abraham rose up from before his dead. There's a time to weep and there is a time to rise. Another book I read uh, a few years ago is a book called Human Rights, R-I-T-E-S. It talks about how we are ritual beings. And it, one of the things that he engages in that book is the reality that our culture has a hard time with death. And he points to a few ancient practices of death rituals. Like, what do you do when a person dies? And he points, for example, to one is the Jewish death ritual. That when you have a loved one who dies, everything is prescribed for you. When, you're, when you experience the death of a loved one, that, that grief threatens to undo you. But at the moment, here's what you do. The next day, here's what you do. When you go to the synagogue this weekend, this is where you sit. This is the color that you wear. This is how many days you wear that color. And then after this period of days, you change back into your ordinary clothes to signify a shift from the time of mourning into back into your real life. And it's a real stabilizing ritual that allows a person to walk through mourning and lament and grief and crying aloud, but also getting back to life after the death of a loved one. In a sense, this is important for those who might run the risk of over grieving their lost ones. But honestly, in our culture, our problem is usually not that we mourn too much, but that we don't mourn at all, which presents its own sort of problem because when we don't mourn things that are sad, then what happens is that that sadness doesn't go anywhere. It stays there. You just kind of stuff it back and then kind of comes out much louder and unpredictably later. But the question I want us to consider as we continue looking through this passage is why is there so much detail about this transaction, which runs from verses 3 through 18? You may have wondered that as Matt was reading the passage. There's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of details put in there. We're not going to go line by line through this engagement. But why is there so much detail? The, pastor could, or excuse me, the passage could have just read, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in a cave in the land of the Hittites. End of chapter. I can think of other very significant events that are given far less space in the Bible. One example is in the book of Judges, Judges chapter 3. There's a, there's a judge called Shamgar. In Judges chapter 3, 31, here's, he gets one verse. After Ehud was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also saved Israel. Next. You want to know, I want to know more about the 600 people killed with an ox bone and the whole salvation of Israel thing. But... That just gets one verse. But here we have a transaction about a burial plot that's given 
an entire chapter. Why all the detail? The elaborate detail is almost confusing. It's not explicitly clear why there's so much detail, but what is clear is that this is a full legal transaction from proposal to negotiation to agreement and then to its execution. For lack of wanting to go into ancient Near Eastern legal transactions, suffice it to say that this is a complete legal transaction. The people Abraham approaches and buys the land from are Hittites. They're Canaanites. That is, these are people who are living in the land of Canaan at the time. Canaan is the promised land. Israel is what it would come to be called. God had said to Abraham that this is the land that he was giving him. And so since the Hittites were the people who lived there, God had not yet showed how, how he was going to give Abraham's family the land. And so Abraham approaches the Hittites to try to secure a burial place for Sarah. There's so much that could be said about this negotiation, but I want to point out two things. The first is this. In the context of this remarkably respectful and generous negotiation on the part of the Hittites, Ephron the Hittite offers to simply give Abraham the field that he's asking for without payment. But Abraham doesn't take it. But here's what, here's what happens. Abraham says this in verses 8 and 9. He says, if you're willing that I should bury my dead out of sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. So Abraham offers to purchase the field at the outset, but then Ephron responds and offers to give it to him. In verse 11, Ephron says, No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field and I give you the cave that is in it. It's an extremely generous offer, but Abraham doesn't take it. You see, the gift of land could have been revoked in a future generation, but a transacted purchase could not. I think that's why this is preserved in such detail. Abraham's intent is to secure this land, not just to bury Sarah, but for his own burial place. And if we read on later in the story, we see that Isaac and his wife and Jacob and his wife, Jacob dies in Egypt and he makes his sons pledge that they will bring him back to be buried in this same cave at Machpelah. So that's the first thing. Abraham's intent is to secure this land for his whole family in a permanent sense. And so verses 16 through 18 make it clear that this transaction is complete and that it's both legitimate and permanent. He wanted to own it for it not to be a gift. And why? Why is ownership of this land so vital? Well, this is the second thing that I want to point out. Where this land is, is important. This burial land is in the land of Canaan, which is the land of promise. And this is significant because the practice at this time is that when you die, you go back to the land of your fathers. Usually, when you die, you go back to the land of your ancestors. But this is not the land of Abraham's fathers. This is the land of God's promise. And you see, the promised land is more than simply a plot of land. It is a plot of land. But it's also the land which points to the new family that God has promised to create through the line of Abraham, through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed, and the land in which God would once again dwell with his people. The promised land was more than just a plot of land. It was the new Eden, the new place where redemption would be accomplished and then the presence of God would be enjoyed by his people. This is the heavenly country that the book of Hebrews talks about. And Abraham's intention is clear. He and his family will remain in the land that God has promised. And this is the second point. We see this. We see in this the second point, the pursuit of hope. In the midst of his grief, Abraham clings to the promises of God. And this hope isn't just something that Abraham thinks about for a few minutes before going back to his ordinary life. It's something that informs his life. He pursues this hope. He secures the gravesite. It's interesting that Abraham's first actual possession in the land that God had promised to give him is a burial place. He buys the field and says, I'm here to stay. And I wonder, I don't know this for sure, but I wonder if this isn't the background of the parable of the treasure in the field that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 13. It's just a one verse parable. Matthew 13, 44, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. 
here with Abraham, Abraham has received the promises of God that point toward the coming kingdom of God, and Abraham believes him. And in faith, Abraham has left behind all he has to purchase this field. And he purchases this field that's strange to him at this time, but it will be the place where God will be with him forever. This hope that Abraham has is something that God has been shaping in him, and it's something that Abraham here responds to by cultivating, by pursuing. Something that Abraham pursues regardless of cost. He asks for the field first and then asks how much it costs. It doesn't matter how much it costs. He will do whatever he can to find his place and to secure his place in this promised land. What hope are you cultivating with your life? What are the things that you are pursuing? What is the foundation that you are building upon? Are you pursuing the kingdom of God? This kingdom that will echo into eternity? Or are you pursuing the kingdom of your own life? The kingdom of wealth, acclaim, of security and safety for you and your loved ones. The kingdom of comfort and ease, all of which will pass away. You see, our life in this world is never passive. Even when it looks passive, we're always cultivating something. Even if the field that we're cultivating is a field of weeds, it's because you have been cultivating it that way. We see Abraham here, the father of all who believe, cultivating his hope in the promise. His hope is in the life to come, the life that will come beyond death. Which brings us to our third point, the security of hope. And I'll begin with this question. Why do, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Why do we honor the dead? Why do we honor those who have died? If we are but shells, then why is there such ceremony at the end of life? It's an interesting question to ponder, especially if you're in here and you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian. Why does every culture, including the secular culture of today, every culture throughout human history, why does every culture have rituals for death that point to some sense of that person enduring beyond the point of death? Well, the Bible gives a clear answer. On the one hand, it's because we as human beings have eternity written on our hearts. But on the other hand, let's consider Abraham here. Why did he honor his dead? Why did the place of Sarah's burial matter to him? It's because of the hope that Abraham had. Matt preached about this last week on Easter. Abraham had hope in the resurrection. The Apostle Paul tells us that the reason that Abraham had the faith required to sacrifice his son Isaac was because he had the faith that God would raise Isaac from the dead. So too does Abraham have this faith about Sarah and about himself, and about all of his descendants who would be buried in this new burial place of this new family. Abraham took care to honor and bury Sarah because of his belief in her future resurrection. The people of God lay bodies to rest in peace, but also to rest in hope. We honor them because life continues. Bodies will be raised. As I said before, death is a key theme in the book of Genesis. As one writer puts it, the promise of the land is one of the major themes of Genesis, but so is death. Death entered the race by sin, and the death of the patriarchs was a harsh reminder of the presence of evil. It brought out the mourning. But death in this passage became the reason for hope. In life, the patriarchs were sojourners. In death, they were heirs of the promise and occupied the land. This is the third point, the security of hope. The Bible is clear that our destination is secure. And here's what I want to ask you. Everyone in this room hopes in something. Everyone hopes in something. What are you hoping in? Is your hope a secure hope? If we allow this passage to bring us into the house of mourning for a moment, this might call to mind a passage from Ecclesiastes chapter 7, where King Solomon tells us twice that attending a house of mourning is better than going to a house of feasting. This, listen to the words. This is Ecclesiastes 7 verses 1 through 4. It says this, A good name is, is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. 
it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. If you are familiar with the Bible, this might call you to Jesus's words in the Sermon on the Mount in a section known as the Beatitudes, the blessed are the so-and-so statements. In these Beatitudes, it's interesting that Jesus doesn't say anything about humor or strength or joy in those. He says, blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Jesus uses these same words from Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Solomon speaks of sorrow being better than laughter, of the day of death being better than the day of birth, of going to a funeral better than going to a festival. How can this be? <laughs> How is it that this is the case? There's at least two reasons why it's better to go to the house of the morning than to the house of feasting. First, they help us to focus on the role of death in our lives, which is ever-present and ever-ignored and avoided. Like I said before, our culture loves happy endings and avoids sadness. You may be familiar with Disney's version of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Listen to uh, what Carl Truman, who's a British scholar, he, he's a British scholar, listen to what Carl Truman wrote about the American obsession with happy endings. I remember my jaw hitting the floor some years ago when I watched a Disney movie, a Disney version of Notre Dame de Paris, where the hunchback does not die but lives happily ever after. But the story of Quasimodo is that the guy with the hump dies at the end and it's all terribly sad. My wife is meant to cry and I'm meant to feel angry at the raw deal Quasimodo has been dealt in the poker game of life. That's the point of the original story. But we love to celebrate good things. We love to dwell on and gather around happy stories to the point of changing the ending of famous stories to suit our preferences so that we can have smiles on our face. Funerals, however, force us to slow down and consider the role of death in our lives. Once a person has died, you can't change that ending. Death points us to a most profound reality that things are not as they should be. And they leave us looking for what to hold on to. The second thing that houses of mourning can do for us in a way that houses of feasting cannot is this. They help us to consider the security of our hope. The question is, are you prepared for your death? Not, I mean, we're not talking about, have you prepared a burial place for your body? We're talking about you and your soul. Donald Gray Barnhouse, who was an American Presbyterian minister for many years, experienced the death of his wife and children, or his wife when their three children were still young. They were driving to the funeral and Barnhouse was trying to think about how he could comfort his children. It was a bright sunny day and as they came up to a stoplight, a big truck pulled up beside them and put them in its shadow. Just then, Barnhouse had an idea. He asked his daughter, which would you rather be hit by, that truck or the shadow of that truck? The shadow, of course, she answered. That's right, Barnhouse said. And that is the way it is with death for a Christian. Jesus was hit by death so that we would only be hit by the shadow of death. It's a sweet moment in the midst of pain to reflect upon a secure hope. As one writer says, the time of death, when the natural inclination is to mourn as the world mourns, should be the time of our greatest demonstration of faith for the recipient of God's promises has hope beyond the grave. As another writer puts it, the death of our relations should effectively, effectually remind us that we are not at home in this world. When they are gone, say, we are going. Coming on the heels of the offering of Isaac and Isaac's deliverance by God, this narrative reinforces Abraham's faith in the life to come. God wants our focus on the here and now to be colored by our secure hope in eternity with him. We see this in the life of Abraham and we see this over and over again as we look through the Bible. Hebrews chapter 11 lists a whole bunch of saints who have gone before us and who have died 
and says that they lived in such a way that made it clear that they were seeking a new homeland. Friends, brothers, sisters, for those who are in Christ, our security or our, our future is secure. Our hope is secure. Just like Donald Barnhouse said to his daughter that Jesus took the blow of the truck so that we might not be hit by it. This is what Jesus did for Sarah and Abraham. It's what Jesus did for Donald Barnhouse and his daughters. It's what Jesus did for you and for me. There is no time like the present to consider the invitation of Jesus to come and trust him and there find life. So as we look at this passage, we've looked at how hope is something that God shapes. We've looked at how hope is shaped and we've looked at how hope is pursued. And we've looked at how our hope in Christ is secure. This is the end of one chapter in redemptive history before another one begins in the next generation, but it's not the end for Sarah. Her life continues. At the point of death, she is face to face with God. Her suffering has ended. She is sanctified. She has been glorified. She is with God. My, one of my favorite songs uh, that we have ever sung is actually a song that we sung for the first time last week on Easter. It's a song called On That Day. It's actually a new hymn. Um, and it's a song where the chorus says, on that day we will see him shining bright, bright as the sun. On that day, we will know him as we lift our voices one. There's coming a day, brothers and sisters, where the suffering that God is currently using to shape us and shape our hearts and mold us will be ended. And for those who are in Christ, that eternity is secure. That day will be a day of rejoicing, of union, of peace, Jesus Christ said to all who are weary and heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. When your life presents you with disappointment and you, could, you are tempted towards cynicism, when your life presents you with loss and you are tempted toward despair, come to Jesus. You who are weary and heavy laden, and he will give you rest. Hear Jesus' gentle call today and come to the God of comfort, the one who tasted death for us, the sympathetic Savior who sees you, who knows you, and who is with you today, walking through everything that you are going through. Because he is good, and his plan is good, and it will be brought to his completion. For your good, for my good, and for his glory. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the promise that you are with us always, even though we might find ourselves in the valley of the shadow of death. Thank you that when we are surrounded by enemies, you prepare a table for us. Sometimes we want to be plucked out of the fire, to just be grabbed out of that valley. But even better than that is you preparing a table before us, sitting down with us and saying, look at me, I'm with you. So Lord, please remind us, speak in the ways that our hearts need to hear. Tell us, show us that you're with us, guiding and shaping and molding us. Please help us to pursue this hope that you've given us that rather than reacting to disappointment and loss with choosing to chase after the things of this world, that you would help us to chase after you in worship, in hope, in our tears, in our anguish. And Lord, I pray that you would give us faith and confidence. Abraham, before he had an awareness of how most of these promises would come to pass, believed. He took you at your word. I pray that you'd help us who have so much more than Abraham did in this Bible that we hold. Help us to have faith in the truth that you are with us, that you are coming for us, that we are secure with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.